good. Uh, my name is Father Pascal Uche. It feels a bit weird to say that, but I'm a priest, almost two months a priest now. Uh, from the 1st of August, Bishop Allen ordained me. And it's a great, great joy to be sharing with you and these Brentwood voices. And I have the privilege to share with you about racial justice and thinking about um, some of the issues that are very important for our times, how we are, as a church, loving and embracing people of all colours, cultures and diversity. A little bit about myself. I uh, was born in Stratford, East London, and lived in Wanstead for many years. And I wanted to be a doctor when I was, uh, when I was young. Um, and then I had some very powerful experiences of God through the youth service, through different prayer groups that helped me to see that God had something uh, different in mind for me, something that really excited me. And, and now I get to embrace fully. And that means I get to serve you, the people of God, um, by celebrating Mass, the sacraments, and uh, being a voice for what I believe Jesus is calling us as a church to do, which is ultimately to love one another and love God. I want to speak about an issue that I think touches our hearts, touches our society, definitely. I want to look uh, in three sections about racial justice. And in the summer of 2020, it was a very heated summer uh, with various different things happening, um, including things across in America that made a lot of people ask the question um, about how do we relate with one another in terms of our, our race? There are people who are not treated rightly um, because of their race. And I wanted to have uh, used this opportunity to kind of delve straight into that and ask us some questions. There's a lovely image that C.S. Lewis gives us in a book that I think can help us enter into this conversation. He says that it would be a, a hard thing, it's always a hard thing, for an egg to be broken and, and a bird to emerge. That's a, that's a difficult process. But he said it'd be impossible for that bird to learn how to fly if it remained an egg. And uh, maybe that's an image for you. It's definitely one for me that reminds me that sometimes we need to ask some difficult questions, go through some difficult processes. But I believe as the Catholic Church, uh, we want to be able to not just address problems, but we want to be able to fly, to fly and to, to get it right. What does it look like to really love one another? So the first section I'd like to speak about with you as we sit down and we uh, engage this topic is the pain that racism brings to our society, to real people, to real communities. So I was born into a Nigerian Catholic family and when I think about the pain of racism, a story that my mum tells me uh, is one of the first that comes to mind. My mum's a teacher in a Catholic school, one that me and my three sisters all went to. And my mum recalls the very painful incident when uh, she heard some parents outside of the school speaking about what class their children were going into. And one of the parents said, we don't want to go, our children to go into Mrs. Uche's class because we don't think our children would understand her. They might not understand her accent. And my mum, even as she recalled that story to us, I could see like the pain that that brought, um, that in some way what she was bringing to the children wasn't necessarily being appreciated by her parents there. That was a painful experience. In the light of the George Floyd um, incidents, another friend of mine uh, told me that in a Catholic school that she worked in, um, there was some staff members who seemed to be picking on her like this didn't happen after the events, but it's just something that she reflected on. And uh, there were certain comments that maybe knowingly or unknowingly really isolated her as a black young woman and she felt it was really uncomfortable to keep working in that school, even to the point where she felt it wasn't just for them, but the way that they were speaking about certain students within the school, she could see there was something really not right about that. And I think it's particularly painful that both of these incidences are within like a Catholic community. Another experience that I think of uh, was uh, in my second to final year at seminary. And we were all excited, uh, being ready to be ordained deacons. And we got to choose the music and to choose what that ceremony would look like. And one of my friends has a Cameroonian descent, 
and I have a Nigerian um, heritage. And so we thought we'd love to have some African music to kind of color the celebration, maybe some drums and some sort of different African singing. Um, and at first the group kind of nodded and thought that would be good. And then just a few days later, we were hearing things around the seminary that it was kind of being laughed at and almost seen as somehow second class, that it wouldn't be the traditional way of doing things. It wouldn't be as good. And maybe my fellow brother seminarians didn't think much of it, but we definitely took that to heart, you know, when we think about some of the comments uh, that were said, uh, and it made that particular expression, maybe the African expression of worship, it made it seem second class or inferior. And that was something that was quite painful. Perhaps um, another experience, not just of mine, but of friends of mine would be how young black people are treated um, by police. I know myself that one time living in Wanstead, I was riding my sister's bike, uh, just going around and, and uh, a policeman stopped me and he said, um, you know, where did you get that bike from? And I was just like, it's my sister's bike. And he said, well, we've had a lot of reports about thefts and things like that in the area. And I, you know, didn't want any trouble. But as I rode away and I thought about that, I was like, you know, what has caused him to say that to me? And I know for other young black men, maybe how when they go to shops, how they might be treated suspiciously by security guards. And, and you can see that, I don't know, there are some difficulties and some quite clear, um, yeah, some, some difficulties and, and, and racist sort of behavior that really affects. And as I use that word, it's quite painful when we reflect on, on how people might be treated because of their race. And maybe you're, uh, a young white person watching and you've not thought about those experiences. I wonder maybe you may have uh, friends of different ethnicities for whom this opportunity could be that you could ask about their experiences, ask about how they're being treated, um, if this has been their experience. Uh, I really think it's a wonderful opportunity that we can grow and it might be quite painful to, to have that conversation but if we really do seek to, to love our brother, our sister, um, one of the ways in which we could do that is being really open to people's stories and experiences. So I'm aware that I've said quite a bit, but I want to encourage you now just to take a moment just to think about doing a few things. So if you've got a bit of paper and a pen, I'd encourage you to bring it out now just so that you can jot these things down. And this can go from more than just uh, listening to a real experience of how we can change as a church, as, a, as the people of God. The first thing I want to ask you is uh, maybe you've witnessed racism, you've seen it in the, in the media, or you might have seen it closer firsthand. I want to ask you, how does that make you feel? When you see somebody on the receiving end of racism, how does that make you feel? So maybe that's the first question that you can just jot down some words, sentences that capture what that makes you feel. Maybe you yourself have been on the receiving end of racism and similarly an opportunity for you to jot down some of your emotions and feelings and thoughts when you think about those experiences. Another exercise that you could do now also is to think about maybe two or three friends or a particular person that you want to ask about their experiences. Maybe you've got a friend of a different ethnicity, black friends, Asian friends, and you want to ask them about their experiences. Maybe write their names down now so that it can go from a, a listening exercise to something that really in a concrete way helps us to, to love uh, and to overcome the evil of racism. So maybe if you just jot those things down and think about how to respond to those questions. everyone. 
Uh, there was a fair few things to think about there when we think about people's experiences, but also how we feel when we hear those experiences, what kind of emotions that stirs up in us. In this section, we want to look at addressing the problem. But before we do that, let's just take a moment uh, to ask the Lord again to be present uh, in our hearts and our minds um, as we delve deeper into this issue. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace to be present to us. That we might open our hearts and our minds truly to hear the hurt and to hear your voice that speaks to heal. Amen. So in this section, what I want to do is to look at addressing the problem. So if section one was looking at acknowledging the pain, uh, this one is about addressing the problem. And as a means of beginning that, I want to invite you again to take your pens and, and paper uh, and to join me on this little quiz that helps to open our eyes really to what the situation currently is in our country. So what I'm going to do is going to ask a few questions and if you select what you feel is the answer, I'll reveal that and then we can unpack maybe what that means uh, for us. So the first question, what proportion of taxi drivers in London are black and Asian? Three options, 94%, 50% or 20%? What do you think? The answer is 94%. And I must admit, when I first saw that, it was quite surprising that that number of black and ethnic minorities are those who drive our minicabs. And this was particularly important around the COVID time because cab drivers are some of the most vulnerable people. They have to work for their livelihood and that exposes them more to, to COVID. And they weren't as protected perhaps as other TfL transport people uh, with what they were given. So think about that and, and unpack that for yourself. Also, maybe think about why is it that black and ethnic minorities feel that they have to work here? Does that say something about opportunities? Our second question is for every one pound of white British wealth, how much wealth is there in the black African and Bangladeshi households? Is it 65p, 10p or 42p? Again, this was quite surprising to me, but it's only 10p in every pound for African and Bangladeshi households. And maybe there's a connection between those two things, that there's not great opportunity and there's definitely not as much wealth. And that disparity leads on to other problems. And maybe it connects to this next question. Young offender institutes are prisons for boys aged 15 to 17 and young adult men aged 18 to 21. What percentage of boys and men in young offenders institutes are from an ethnic minority background? 51%, 62% or 43%? So the answer to that one is 51% of young offenders in these different institutes are from black minority ethnic uh, communities. Again, that's quite high. And as we've done with the, the rest of the, the questions, you can see that maybe there's a link there in terms of opportunities, a link there in terms of ways in which people can um, live their life in a successful way, Opportunities, again, that people have, maybe this feeds into it. And it'd be interesting for you maybe to note down your own observations, you know, why you think that these things are, are the case. And finally, I'd like to ask this question. So ethnic minority people are more likely to access mental health services via the criminal justice system than white people. How much more likely are ethnic minority people to access mental health services via the criminal justice system than white people? So that they have to go into the criminal justice system first before they actually are able to access uh, mental health care. Is it 40% more likely, 17% more likely or 32%? And the answer here is 42%. Uh, Again, 
showing that there's a disparity and all of these questions hopefully is helping you to see that there is something uh, in the system or at least very clear to us that is uh, that is wrong in terms of maybe access people have to healthcare or access people have to to opportunities that means um, there's a segregation almost between those of different minorities purely based on the color of their skin. So it'd be, it would be a good opportunity for you to think about those answers and maybe to ask yourself why that might be. And again, just being aware of how you feel about that. So those questions kind of share about where we are and what's actually happening. One of the issues that we also have is facing the problem of unconscious bias. And with those things currently the case, maybe it's like the youth offenders or uh, those who work in cabs and who are mainly poor in some ways. Flowing from that sometimes is an unconscious bias that we may have. So all of the stuff that's happened recently um, over the summer or when racism has been brought up, a friend of mine described it as a powder cake moment because it was like it brought to the surface many different issues that people may not have been aware was happening. And you might be watching and thinking, actually, I've never seen racism or heard of racism, but I want to invite you just to challenge that place that actually there is racism, even if it's not as explicit as those first cases, there is racism that's happening around us, sometimes coming from unconscious bias. I'll give you one example of something that was very interesting to me. So I'm a big football fan, and I know I'm sure there's a few football fans watching out there. And a friend of mine gave me an article that said there was a university in America that were looking at how commentators spoke about football players. And they were able to see from their conclusion that when the commentators were speaking about black players, it would tend to be um, that they'd speak about their strength and speed. But for players who played equivalently at their white counterparts, they'd speak about their intelligence and their skillfulness. And there was a subtle difference there between how they were referring to players of different races. Now, there are some different traits, perhaps, that black players and white players have. But I think the research was really bringing out a subtle subconscious bias um, that actually doesn't favor uh, people of black and minority backgrounds. And it's these kind of subtle things that can sometimes be in our minds when we think about particular races. I mean, I challenge you, when you think about an Asian person, what comes to mind? When you think about a black young boy, what comes to mind? When you think about a, a white old woman, what comes to mind? If we're honest, some of the things that shape our understanding of people are biases that we get to question today so that we can purify our minds and our hearts to truly respect and treat the other as other. So as we come to the end of this section, I just want to leave two questions with you. One is to think back to the questions that we answered at the beginning and to take your pen and paper again and just to write down what surprised you, which particular answer or question has really made you think or stop. And maybe you could write down a word or a phrase that describes how you, how you feel in response to that. And then I'd ask you to think about your friendship groups, the different communities that you're part of, your dance group or your football group, um, your parish or your school community. And to ask yourself honestly, how diverse are those groups. And if they're not very diverse, to then ask yourself, have I ever been guilty then of filling in the gap of how I describe others, for example, how I describe black people or Asian people or white people, based on something that I don't really fully know because I'm not fully engaged with those communities and cultures. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Just to think about your friendship groups and ask yourself the honest question, has there ever been unconscious bias? So this section really has been just about to hold some of that uh, 
before we think about solving it and the solutions that maybe God wants to offer us as a people looking to grow in his image and likeness. section now we're looking at aiming towards our potential um, it's my deepest belief that we as the Catholic Church should be at the front of any move for justice any move for equality because it's who we are as Catholic that's our, our name it's our, our center and just very recently Pope Francis released a document called Fratelli Tutti which is brothers and sisters together and in it he speaks about the need to work together, to be one body, to overcome all sorts of division, including racism. I want to tell you about a favorite saint of mine, one who himself had to overcome racism and in doing so, opened up really what it is to be Catholic uh, and to, to realize the potential that we have as brothers and sisters. So Saint Martin de Porres was born in the 16th century in Peru and he had a black mother and a white Spanish father. And he experienced racism from the get-go because initially his dad kind of abandoned him because he was a child of color and it was frowned upon. But when his dad eventually came back into his life and uh, helped uh, Martin at the time, Martin's desire was to be a religious. And so he went to the Dominicans where he experienced racism again. They said, we, we don't take men of color. And he said, look, I'm so much more happy to just clean and just, just help out. I don't need to be a brother. Let me just, just help out. And that's how he began his religious life. And then with time, he began to, to work with the sick in the infirmary and his patience, his kindness, his counsel um, really began to touch the whole community. So much so that Martin was really taken in and became one of the, the, the spiritual directors there, one of the, the, the people that they really looked up to, he was able to not be damaged by that racism, but overcome it with, with a greater love. And that for me uh, is part of what it means to, to be Catholic, is to recognize that we have great potential, that we can overcome racism, and then really celebrate our diversity. Speaking of celebrating our diversity, a place that I was really fortunate to be able to see this was at World Youth Day. And I hope I'm speaking to many young people who have been to World Youth Day. You will know just what a joy it is to see people from all over the world. So cast your minds, if you can, to Sydney, Australia. It was 2008, and that was my first ever experience of World Youth Day. And I was one of half a million young people and they were people from all over the world, every color, culture, flag imaginable. And we were all one body, one church. And I remember there was a Franciscan who said to me, Pascal, this is the world as it should be. Not merely that we can tolerate each other and walk side by side and say, okay, I've got black friends or I've got Asian friends or I've got white friends. No, it was where we were sharing our diversity, sharing the differences and celebrating those things. And I really look forward to that being a reality that we can embody, one that we can have as Catholics. It's interesting, maybe you can see the cross behind me here. And that cross has got different shades of wood, uh, but it all comes together to make one cross. And that's the purpose. God wants to unite all things, all colours, all people together in Christ. And so maybe that's a bit of an image that's been behind us that speaks to where we're hoping to go, the potential that we have as Catholics. I want you to take a moment now to think about the people who inspire you. You might ask, why, why am I saying that? I want you to think about the different cultures or races of the people who inspire you. Are they all from your own race or 
have you allowed yourself to really celebrate and be like, that person inspires me and they're from a completely different background, a completely different culture. Why not? So think about the people who inspire you. So that's something I want you to think about as we ask ourselves, what's our potential in overcoming racism? So just as we think of concluding, another saint who really inspires me to think about our potential as Catholics, as children of God, is Saint Josephine Bikita. So she's a 20th century saint, so more modern than Martin de Porritz. And she was sold as a slave, as a young girl, and underwent some really horrific abuse and crime against her at the hands of slave owners. She eventually made her way out to Italy and she was taken in by a really lovely family and was attracted to the Catholic faith. She underwent a huge conversion. And when she was asked, what would you say to your slave owners now? What would you do to them if you, if you could get your own back, so to speak? What would you do? And Josephine looked back with great love and said, I would, I'd kiss their hands because it's because of them that I've come to know Christ. Yeah, it's been a hard and difficult journey, but I've come to know Christ. And that for her brought her such peace and such joy that she shows again how in her very person she was able to overcome the evil of racism. And that brings me to you watching. You know, these are not theories that we're just thinking about and, and ideas that we're having or feelings that we're feeling, but you are concrete instruments of change. Even as you watch this video, the Lord desires you to be a part of the change he desperately desires to see in his church, leading the way for the world at large. A friend of mine once said that sometimes people describe the church as if they had to describe the church, they would say, the church is an old white man. And that is so not true. For now, anyway, I'm a young black man, black Catholic priest and proud to be Catholic. My experience of World Youth Day, my experience of the church in East London or wherever I've been has helped me to see that I can be who I am and fully be Catholic. And I want to encourage you to really embrace your own identity and to throw yourself into what it means to be a child of God. And that might mean your youth group. That might mean in 2023, looking to go to the next World Youth Day to really embrace God's plan for your life. And a part of that plan is that you would express your diversity. Are you a young black person? Are you a young white person or a young Asian person? The church is home for you. And by you concretely responding to what you're feeling, you're making the church home for somebody else. Because when they see you, it will help them to know that I can be at home here that this is where I'm called to be. And that should be the case for every young Catholic. I want to thank God for all of you, to thank you for watching and to pray that you don't just think, oh, that was a nice thing, but that you really move into action. And that action comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember on Pentecost Sunday, there were all those people of different races and uh, cultures, but the Holy Spirit came and they were all able to understand God's love, the message of the good news. So maybe Pentecost is an image that we can leave with, that if really we're filled with his spirit, then we can be one. Then we can speak a language that all of us can understand. And we as Catholics will be at the front of um, this movement for real equality and celebration of the diversity that has been willed by our good and loving God himself. So let's just take a moment to uh, say a prayer or to listen to a prayer composed by Pope Francis at the end of that document, Fratelli Tutti. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice and peace. Move us to create the healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects and shared dreams. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.